بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So inshallah, if you will skip to page 101. The theme of the, the selections that I'm going to be reading is the suffering of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the hands of the creation. And the forward to discuss this theme is what? Is that a person may mistakenly believe that because they say la ilaha illallah and because they have made the intention to walk the path of righteousness and because they have made the intention to do what's right that somehow Allah is obliged to be, uh, uh, to make them uh, have a comfortable and luxurious service and nothing could be further from the truth nothing could be further from the truth rather like the ayah that we mentioned in the beginning of Surah Al-Ankabut in the Khutbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, do the people think that they will be left to say, we believe and they will not be tested. And indeed we tested those who came before. And Allah ta'ala will know through that test who is the one who is truthful and who is the one whose claim is a lie. And Allah ta'ala will use the creation as an instrument of that test. And sometimes it becomes very demoralizing for a person. It becomes very demoralizing for a person to be subjugated at the hands of the creation. Because a person says, there is no God except for Allah. And then afterward they receive so much pain and so much suffering at the hands of the creation. And it leaves them flabbergasted. And it leaves them exactly like Sheikh Tamim said. With the question inside, or Sheikh Musa and Sheikh Tamim both said, with the question inside of their minds and in their hearts, that... If Allah loved me and if Allah was really there, how could He let this happen to me? And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa you see in his Mubarak example that He's the beloved of Allah Ta'ala. He's the one who Allah Ta'ala took the most crooked of people and straightened them and made them the most righteous. He's the one who Allah Ta'ala made Jannah haram on every person from mankind except for the one who bears witness that Muhammad the Rasulullah, that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. And yet, and yet, all different types of creation, all different types of creation, big and small, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him with them. To see, will he be patient? To see, will he be grateful? And so that we can also see that there is no test, big or small, except for we also have to show the same patience and we have to also show the same gratitude. So we begin the first hadith, and Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu qala bayna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that a layla till you salli fa wada'a yadahu ala al-ardi fa ladagathu aqrabun fa tanawalaha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bina'lihi fa qatalaha fa laman sarafa qala la'ana Allahu al-aqraba ma tada'u musalliyan wala ghayrahu aw nabiyan aw ghayrahu thumma da'a bimilhin wa ma'in فجعله في إناء ثم جعل يصبه على إصبعه حيث لدغته يمسحها ويعوذها بالمعوذتين رواه البيهقي في شعب الإمام سيدنا علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله تعالى عنه وكرم الله وجهه عليه السلام narrates that one night the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم was praying he placed his hand upon the ground and a scorpion stung him a scorpion stung him. Has anyone here been stung by a scorpion before? It's not fun times. It's not fun times. They had scorpions in Mauritania. And really, mashallah, when you're in the desert and people tell you about snakes and scorpions and all sorts of other weird stuff, uh, really, you, you, you learn du'as real quick. And the funny thing is this is that the same Allah sent the scorpions there. He's the same one who can send you harm here as well. And the one who protects you from the scorpion and the snake over there, he's the one, same one who protects you from, from, from harm in Parma and on Lorraine and wherever you are. But this is a blessing that some people, they're aware of it and some people are heedless. But at any rate, the scorpion stinging you is not fun times. The scorpions in Mauritania, they're, they're a bit bigger. 
And if they sting you in your foot, the swelling will go all the way up to the side of uh, up your leg, up the side of your hip, and up to your side. If you're weak or if you're sick, it may kill you. But a healthy person generally won't kill them. The scorpions in the Arabian Peninsula are both of the larger size, and they're the ones of the smaller size as well. The smaller size ones will kill you. You'll die. People have died from these things. Uh, there are a great number of our mashayikh when we went to go study, they would go to Hajj and stand in front of the Kaaba and ask Allah Ta'ala for protection for their students. Alhamdulillah, Murabit al Hajj, Allah Ta'ala have mercy on him, Qaddasallahu Sirrahu, Rahimahullah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, Rahmatan wa Asi'a. Tarahuman, inshallah, Yukunu, Akhiru Fa'idatan, wa Ifadatan Lana min, 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 min Ifadatihi Lahu. Uh, he, he made dua in Hajj, he made Hajj on foot when there was still a Sultan in Istanbul. And uh, he made dua and he earnestly entreated uh, in, uh, Allah Ta'ala to save his students from being bitten by snakes. Alhamdulillah, from that time until now, we haven't heard of anybody uh, who studied there that was bitten by snakes. But the scorpions, people get hit by them every now and again. I believe it's Shaykh Muhammad Hassan with the Dadu, he also made for his, for he saw a dream in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inshallah, your students will be protected from the snakes, but the scorpions will get them. <laughs> so imagine that. This is something we don't even have to deal with anymore, Alhamdulillah. And who's getting stung by this insect? Imagine if you get, you know, uh, if, you, if Pharaoh is your enemy, there's some prestige in that, right? If Abu Jahl and the chiefs of Quraysh get together and plot against you, there's some prestige in it. This is an insect. It doesn't think, it doesn't talk, it doesn't have money, it does not, it's just an insect. That one night the Messenger of Allah وسلم, placed his hand on, on the ground, his Mubarak hand on the ground وسلم, and a scorpion stung him. So the Messenger of Allah وسلم, struck it and killed it with his sandal. There was no one there to do it for him, he had to do it himself. And imagine the amount of pain that it must have caused. And he had to kill it himself, sallallahu alayhi wa It was such a simple thing. All he needed to do was quash it with his sandal. But it somehow slipped by. And it stung him, sallallahu alayhi wa And when he came out of his salat, while he's praying, after the salat, he waited. And then afterward, he says, May Allah ta'ala curse the scorpion. He doesn't even leave a person uh, uh, whether or not they're praying. And he doesn't leave a person whether or not they're a nabi. Meaning what? It hurt him, it bothered him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam caused him grief, it caused him pain, it caused him suffering. It's not like, you know, Sayyidina uh, 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 Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's the beauty of him. Don't let people turn him into some sort of mythical figure, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a human being. If he was an angel, it wouldn't have been miraculous. The actual miracle is that he was a human being and he still was as good as he was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you try to make him like a mythical figure, then you, you lose that because he no longer becomes a an example for you. So when we say that, we don't say it in order to reduce a'udhu billah or disrespect the maqam of the Prophet In fact, in fact, if he was this superhuman angelic figure that's, that, that, that's, that is, doesn't have a body, it doesn't have pain, it doesn't feel suffering, it doesn't get hungry, it doesn't get thirsty, it doesn't get irritated when, when those things that irritate every other human being irritate them, then it would have been less impressive in fact. But the fact is that he had to deal with all those things and he still suppressed them inside and he still did what was right, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he had to kill the scorpion himself and he felt the pain, it bothered him. You know, and he said that Allah cursed the scorpion, it doesn't leave a person whether or not they're in prayer, it doesn't leave the person whether or not they're a prophet. Then he asked for some salt and water, which is what? It's taking the means. Salting the, salting the wound, it's taking the means. Obviously they didn't have anti-venom like, you know, like we have in hospitals nowadays. Um, you know, that costs like $10,000 a vial and are like, mashallah, a technological and medical feat to be able to synthesize. What could they do in those days? They did things like this, that they would salt the wound, etc. So he took the means in order to cure, in order to stem and mitigate the, the harm from the, uh, uh, from the bite. And uh, he uh, mixed the salt and water and poured it over his uh, finger where the scorpion had stung his mubarak finger, sallallahu alayhi wa can you imagine that if someone, if their own child, Allah protect all of our children, if you saw your child being stung by a scorpion, like, you know, how much rahmah you'd have feel, feel for them. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is more beloved to the, the, the companions and to the awliya and the ahlullah and this ummah. Hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min walidihi wa waladihi wa nasi ajma'in. That a person's iman is not perfect until he's more beloved to them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam than a person's parents and then their children and then all other people. 
وفي رواية حتى أكون أحب إليه من نفسه التي بين جنبه until I become more beloved to him than his own soul that resides between his two sides that imagine the, the companion saw and Allah saw and imagine Allah saw him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how beautiful he was in the eyes of Allah ta'ala that he didn't even complain what did he do? like another man like another man would do but he's not like another man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he carried the burden of the, of the salvation of the entire creation but in his humility like any other man what did he do? he killed the scorpion with his own hand and then he mixed the salt and water and poured it on his own wound. And he, uh, 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 he expressed his angst in a way that doesn't upset the Lord. And uh, 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 he wiped it over his finger. He poured the water over his finger uh, uh, where it had stung him. And he, uh, as he wiped over it, he read Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas. Meaning what? The, the physical cure, the cure in the world of causes and effects he took and we take because it's sunnah, even though our iman is what? Our iman is that only Allah the one has the cure. The salt and water is not going to help you. The medicine, the anti-venom is not going to help you. Only Allah helps you. But it's a sunnah he taught us that we should also take the, take the means as well. Like, uh, uh, mashallah, uh, like we read, mashallah, in the, uh, in, I forget what it was. I think it was, it was one of the Arabic shuruhat of, uh, 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 of, of one of the books of hadith. Uh, but the, the verse was quoted, where's, where's our Kashmiri friend? Where is he? Is he, is he, is he, where? There you are. Does it raise your hand when I ask where you are? Man? Right? I forget which one it was. One of the muhaddithin actually quoted in the sharh of uh, the, the, the athar attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-kasibu habibullah. That the one who earns, the one who earns for his family is the beloved of Allah. They quoted the verse in Farsi of Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi. I remember reading it. I became so happy. Who's the first one I called? I called Mawlana Tamim. I said, oh, check this out. It's awesome. MashaAllah. Gartawakun mikuni darkarkun. Kishtkun pastakye barjabbarkun. If you trust in Allah Ta'ala, then trust in Allah while you're working. Don't just sit there and say, oh, I'm trusting in Allah. No. Trust is a state inside of the heart. So let the body do the work and the heart is trusting in Allah. Kishkun pastakiya bal jabbar kun. Do the work, but let your uh, let your yourself, your inside, your heart lean on on the one who is possessed possessed of brute strength. Al jabbar jalla wa ala. Ramzi al kasib habibullah shanu. If you want to know the secret of the one who earns is the beloved of Allah, then listen. As to dar tawakkul as sabal kahil masho. That from, let your the expression of your your trust in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala be in in your heart having given up hope in the means. You take the means why? Because it's a sunnah. It's also an act of worship because the Prophet Sallallahu did it. But inside of your heart, you've given up hope that my work, my intelligence, my smartness, my experience, my uh, uh, the help, my armies, my money, all of these things. These are not not ever going to help me. When Allah wants to, all of them become useless. They become a curse. And so the, the, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you see that, that he was tested with like the smallest of things. He was tested by what? By an insect. And he did everything, everything that he asked us to do, that we feel like we're too good for and we're like, why me, why me? He did everything himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and didn't utter a complaint. So then we uh, switch to page 104. Uh, and mashallah, please, uh, mashayf, uh, mashayf kiram. Please uh, add, inshallah. Don't let me steamroll you and just jump right in, inshallah, because your words are of more benefit. We, we then jump from like uh, zero to a hundred. So now we're talking about the, the, the patience of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We were talking about it with an insect. Now, what is he patient with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in this uh, next hadith? Ta'ahudu Qurayshin ala qatlihi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَتَوَكُّلُهُ عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِ وَحِفْظُ اللَّهِ إِيَّاهُ The path of Quraysh, the Sadatul Arab, the Zu'ama al Arab, the chiefs and the noblemen and the Ashraf of the Arabs, all of them conspired, get, got together. تَعَاهُدْ is مِنْ بَابِ التَّفَاعُلْ Meaning what? Everybody's a fa'il, there's no maf'ul bihi. They all got together, it's a conspiracy between all of them. They all agreed with one another. They all were on uh, one mind and one heart. That they were going to do what? That they were going to do the most disgusting thing that a person could ever make intention to do, which is to kill the Messenger of Allah. 
Imagine having to make account for that on the Day of Judgment. That person would think that the people who are getting drunk and committing zina and gambling and uh, uh, you know, uh, doing insurance fraud and running red lights, those are, those are the awliya compared to these people. The pact of Quraysh to kill him sallallahu alayhi wa and his trust upon his Lord Jalla wa Ala and Allah's protection of him. عن سعيد بن جبير رحمه الله تبارك وتعالى عن عبد الله بن عباس رضي الله عنه أن الملأ من قريش اجتمعوا في في الحجر فتعاهدوا باللات والعزة ومنات ثالثة ثالثة الأخرى لو قد رأينا محمدا قمنا إليه قيام رجل واحد فلم نفارقه حتى نقتله قال فأقبلت فاطمة تبكي حتى دخلت على أبيها عليه السلام فقالت هؤلاء الملأ من قومك في الحجر قد تعاهدوا الله قد رأوك قاموا إليك فقتلوك فليس منهم رجل إلا قد عرف نصيبه من دمك قال صلى الله عليه وسلم يا بنية أدني وضوءا فتوضأ ثم دخل عليهم المسجد فلما رأوه قالوا هو هذا هو هذا فخفضوا أبصارهم وعقروا في مجالسهم فلم يرفع إليه أبصارهم ولم يقم منهم رجل فأخبر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى قام على رؤوسهم قد أخذ قبضة من تراب فحصبهم بها وقال شاهت الوجوه قال فما أصابت رجلا منهم حصات إلا قتل يوم بدر كافرا رواه أحمد وقال الهيثمي رواه أحمد بإسنادين ورجال أحدهما رجال الصحة صحيح قهري and I Sami pay attention the duas that you read and the orad that you read they're not in vain we should make dua we don't make dua enough learn the du'as from the mashayikh that transmit them from the Prophet ﷺ, there's great power in them. There's great protection in them. The one who reads them, that person Allah Ta'ala will never leave them behind, not in this world nor in the hereafter. Sa'id bin Jubair, who was one of the Rahimahullah Tabarakwa Ta'ala, who was one of the, the uh, uh, companions of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma, and one of the great tabi'een through which the hadith are transmitted, the qira'at are transmitted, the uh, tafsir of the Qur'an is transmitted. He was killed, he was killed uh, in Zulm by Hajjaj bin Yusuf, the homicidal maniac enforcer of Banu Umayya in the reign of Abdul Malik bin Marwan and his son Al-Walid. And uh, when he was, it was it said that when, when uh, 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 Hajjaj told him, I'm going to kill you. Don't think you're better, you don't think that you're such a big shot. He says, I've killed better people than you. It's literally a hadith in Bukhari that Hajjaj killed Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu in Hajj. He says, you think I'm afraid of you? I'll, kill, I'll end your life. I killed bigger people than you. And what did Sa'id bin Jubair say? Because it's interesting, he's narrating this hadith. And look at the nasib, the, the, you know, the person who loves Rasulullah. Look how ajib the, the, the mushabaha and the, the resemblance of their life becomes with that of Rasulullah. You struggle to be like the Messenger of Allah and what you can be, and Allah will make you like him and what you can't on your own. So he said to uh, Hajjaj when he gave him the death sentence and he mocked him and said, I killed better than you. He says, yes, all of those who you killed were better than me. He said that they were, they were better than me because they forgave you before you had killed them. That's why you got off scot-free. I'm not going to forgive you. And he killed him and over the matter of the next days, he would see visions of the, uh, of the, the murdered and Shaheed Sa'id bin Jubayl. And it taunted him until he went mad and he died. It killed him. And he would say, Mali was Sa'id bin Jubair. He says, Sa'id bin Jubair, leave me alone. Oh, you know, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? After he'd killed him and he'd been buried in the ground. So he's narrating this hadith from Abdullah bin Abbas, from his shaykh, from his teacher, and from his ustad. Allah Ta'ala have, uh, uh, be pleased with both of them. That the, that the, 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 the privy council of Quraysh, the leaders and the rulers of Quraysh, ijtama'u fil hijr. They got together... Uh, uh, in, 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 in the Hijr. Where, where is the Hijr? Who knows? It's a place in Mecca. Where is it? 
It's literally inside the Kaaba. You know the semicircular wall that's next to the next to the uh, uh, cubicle building of the Kaaba. That's the unfinished part of the Kaaba. It's also what's inside of it is also inside the Kaaba. I apologize. Like I don't have palsy. Like I, I shake when I hear read these things just because like these majalis are. When you hear the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like I don't know what to do. I literally. I, I love to drink coffee. I drink half a gallon of coffee at Sheikh Musa's house like every day. This morning, I knew this was going to happen. I told him I don't want to drink it because it's going to be too much for me. It's going to like push me over the top. Like, so I, I apologize. Like, forgive me for this. That they got together in the Hijr and the Kaaba to do what is the worst and the most blasphemous profanity that a person could ever intend in the creation of Allah. Allah Ta'ala, if you insult Allah, he, He'll forgive you these things. He'll never forgive you for them. So they got together and they took the cursed names of their idols, Allah al Uzza and Manat al Taghiya. The, the, their three goddesses of Lat and Uzza and Manat. One of the greatest honors that the, that the companions had was that they destroyed all three of their idols by their own Mubarak hands. Radiallahu anhu, Allah Ta'ala raised their ranks amongst the awliya and Jannah forever for it. They said, if we see Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of us will stand together as one man stands against him. And we'll keep at him and we won't leave him until we kill him. And who heard this? Say the Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha heard this. Imagine that she heard this that they're gonna kill her father sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Just because all he wanted to do was was to give bring them salvation and save them from ignorance and save them from the hellfire. And maybe if he heard it, the plan himself, it wouldn't have been as painful. But imagine his baby daughter, his baby girl, she heard it. By Rashid, you have a little girl. Imagine the Prophet Sallallahu probably pained him. The idea of getting killed didn't pay, pain him as much as the taklif that, that they caused to his, 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 his daughter, to his baby girl. Ali has salam. So she came home crying. And she entered the house of her father. And she said, these people, they're, they're the leaders of your own home. They're your own people. And they got together inside the Hijr, inside of the Kaaba itself. And they took a blood oath with one, one another. That when they see you, all of them will stand and all of them will kill you together. And there's not one of them except for they've already made their intention to take a portion of your blood. And what did the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say to her? He says, oh my dear daughter, oh my dear child, bring me the water of wudu. Adni wadu'an. The word wadu, I read it wrong. I said, adni wadu'an. Wadu is the, 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 the container of, sorry, the water of wadu and wudu is the container, right? And wudu is the actual like, act of, of ablution. He says, my dear daughter, bring me the, the water of wudu. How do you know, mashallah, people turn on the faucet and like, let, the, uh, let the water waste? and they splash it here and there, and maybe they uh, don't even want to wash their feet, or maybe they miss a spot. And when me and Shaykh Musa sit in the community room to teach the fiqh of wudu, they say, this is not worth my time. But look at what was the isbah of the wudu of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what was the result of it. So the first thing he said to her when she was crying is, oh my dear daughter, bring me the, 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 the water of wudu. And so he made wudu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it was a wudu unlike our wudu. And then, uh, then where did he go? They were they made this plot where in the in the Hijr, in the Kaaba itself. And so uh, he himself then entered the Masjid al-Haram, the proximity of the, the Kaaba. And when they saw him, all of them said to one another, with their tongues of shayateen, they said, "He's the one. He's here. This is the one. He's the one. He's the one." But then thereafter, their gaze is lowered. And they were, uh, 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 their gazes were, their gaze was lowered, and they're fixed in their places. They were unable to get up. They were unable to do anything. And they were un unable to even raise their eyes toward Him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is one of the, this is one of the uh, uh, beautiful gifts Allah gave the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Nusirtu bil ru'bi masirat al shahr, that I was given victory just through the, the, the sheer amount of awe people will have of me in the direction of one month's travel in every, every direction. Wallahu alam, they say that in the history books there was one battle in Andalus 
that the Spaniards, they saw the, 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 the Aslaf, their armies, their Arab and Berber armies, mashallah, using the swak from, from the other side of the battlefield. And when they parlayed with the, with the, uh, the, the Muslim generals, they said, what are they doing what, with their teeth? They learned to brush their teeth from us, by the way. We should do it too. Our forefathers, they learned to brush their teeth from our forefathers. So what are they doing? And so one of the Muslim generals said, they're sharpening their teeth because we're going to eat you. And the Spanish generals freaked out. And like after talking to each other for a little bit, they're like, hey, you know, if we surrender, you promise you won't eat us? And they're like, look at each other and they're like, yeah, we won't eat you. <laughs> what is it? This is, not a, this, this is a spiritual quality. That when the haq comes, the people of battle freak out. This is one of the reasons, you know, why everyone says terrorist, 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 this and that, the other thing. It's not because, you know, coaches going and like hijacking planes on the weekend and, you know, like by Kamran, you know, will like go rob a liquor store on the way to Khalil Center from the city or whatever. It's not, that's not what it's about. What is it? When someone is doing something wrong and they see someone who's doing something good, Allah Ta'ala will subjugate the, the former heart to the latter. And so at any rate, what happens? They lower their gaze and they, they're overwhelmed. Allah Ta'ala overwhelms them. They cannot move. It's also part of the his right? That if we wish to, we would transfigure them and we will uh, uh, make them uh, uh, stuck in their place so that they can neither go forward nor, nor can they go back. So they're fixed in their place and not a single man from amongst them could stand against him. So the Messenger of Allah وسلم, literally walked up to them. And he stood over their heads. And he said, Shahat al Wujuh. May their faces be disfigured. Every one of these, every one of these shayateen, the ones who lock up our brothers and sisters in Turkestan, the ones who flooded their uh, battle armies of idol worshippers in Kashmir, the ones who occupied the sacred lands in Al Quds al Sharif and the Ard Muqaddas and Ard Mubarak around it, the ones who killed our brothers and sisters in Burma, all of them. All of them, when you hear them, when you see them, know Allah Ta'ala is over every one of their heads. You read Shahid al Wujud, don't just go through the word like, you know, like, إِذَا مَرُوا بِاللَّهُوِ مَرُوا كِرَامًا Like you're just trying to get it out of the way. Make niya for these people, Shahid al Wujud. وَعَانَتْ الْوُجُوهُ لِلْحَيِّ الْقَيُّمِ وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ حَمَلَ ظُلْمَ He stood over their heads and he said, Shahid al Wujud. May their faces be disfigured. And he threw dust over them. Every single one of them that was struck by one of the pebbles from that handful of dust, every one of them was killed on Badr uh, as a disbeliever, as a kafir. This isn't the Prophet ﷺ. It's Allah. <laughs> Rasul ﷺ didn't care. He in fact wanted everyone to be forgiven and wanted everyone to be guided. He forgave them. Allah didn't forgive them. When Allah loves you, then the, the whole mu'amala changes. The whole transaction changes, it increases, it goes up to a higher level. You don't even have to take care of, care about taking care of vengeance. Allah Ta'ala will bring those circumstances together. He will bring that same Pharaoh who is sitting in his palace and all of his soldiers in their homes and in their gardens enjoying their families. He'll bring them out of their houses and make them themselves run into the sea in order to be crushed. Allah Ta'ala didn't create any Fir'aun except for he made a sea to drown him in. Allah Ta'ala will give the believers the joy of seeing that day one day if they don't repent. If not in this world, then in the hereafter. And it's not our job to worry about their vengeance or to care, to be upset about killing them or what happens to them, whether they die or they repent or any of these things. There's an Allah who will take the vengeance for you if you trust in Him. Do you guys want to add something? The... Uh, uh, Hijab al-Mushrikeen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sitr al-malaikati iyyahu The idolaters insult toward the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the angels concealing him An Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhum Qala lamma nazalat tabbat yada abi lahab جاءت امرأة أبي لهب إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ومعه أبو بكر فلما رآها أبو بكر قال يا رسول الله إنها امرأة بذيئة وأخاف أن يؤذيك أن يؤذيك عفوا فلو قمت قال إنها لن تراني فجاءت 
فقالت يا أبا بكر إن صاحبك صاحبك حجاني قال لا وما يقول الشعر قالت أنت عندي مصدق وانصرفت فقلت يا رسول الله لم ترك قال لا لم يزل ملك يسترني عنها بجناح بجناح بجناحه جناحه أنا It's not wing. Yeah. Jana or Jana? Yeah, I'm sorry, Jana. Jana is something else. Yeah. Rawahu ibn Hibbana fi Sahihihi. Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with both of them, narrates that when Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab came down, what was it? You know, so people ask this why is this surah in the Quran mocking a, 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 a dead Kafir and his wife? His Kuwait our wife. Why is this even a part of the Quran? You know why it is? So that you know, so that you know that when somebody speaks the batal, when somebody harms the person who does the haq, you may think in this dunya that how are we subjugated to these people? You're not. Allah sees everything and Allah hates them. Don't think just because the, the punishment doesn't come down instantaneously upon them that, that their, uh, their thing, their, their evil that they're doing is not noticed by Allah and not hated by Him. And this is a miracle of the Quran as well. If Abu Lahab really wanted to troll uh, Islam and troll the Prophet وسلم, he could have even feigned conversion, just to say, "Oh, look, you know, your Quran is not uh, <laughs> your Quran is uh, is not true." But he didn't. She didn't. When this Tabat Yada, may Abu Lahab perish, was revealed, the wife of Abu Lahab, she came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam while Abu Bakr was with him. When Abu Bakr saw her. Uh, uh, and, and you know, these are, by the way, he's a closer relative to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than Abu Jahl and Al-Walid ibn Mughira are. He's literally the father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's like, brother. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married two of his daughters to, to the two sons of Abu Lahab, Utbah and Utaybah because of that kinship bond that they had with one another. And this disgusting uh, person and his disgusting wife, they incited their sons to divorce their good wives for no reason except for to cause grief to the Prophet ﷺ to his baby daughters. Imagine that. Again, if, the, if they did something directly to him, it wouldn't have hurt as much as it would have to cause pain and grief to, to his daughters. And really it's an honor that, that they, uh, they were not halal for them and that, that they should, Allah Ta'ala replaced for them a, 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 a husband better than those, those two. There are some people who claim the love of the Ahlul Bayt and they curse Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu. Utbah and Utaybah were from Banu Hashim and the deeds of their father disgraced them so much that they were kicked out of the family. And Uthman radiallahu anhu, the one that they curse, look how, 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 how he treated the daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and look how he honored them. That the Rasul ﷺ married one, one of them to him and she passed away from this world. And then he married the second one and she passed from this world. And the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was so pleased with how much honor and respect that he gave to his daughter ﷺ. He said, if I had a third daughter that needed to be married, I would have married her to you, to, to this Uthman as well. So this woman is a piece of work. When she sees, uh, when she sees Abu Bakr anhu, and the Prophet ﷺ is with him, Abu Bakr himself said, Ya Rasulullah, this woman is, she's a nasty woman, she's a foul-tongued woman. Uh, and I'm uh, afraid that she's going to say something uh, like horrible to you. So let's just get up and leave. You see that? This is the Abu Bakr, he's the closest in, 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 in his character to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu he's not, Alaihi Wasallam. He's not like jonesing for a fight. Rather, he's the one. This is the sifa of mercy in him that he doesn't want to. Uh, he just he doesn't want to be a fitna for other people. He doesn't want you know to cause unnecessary unnecessary commotion and ruckus. So he says, "Let's." That, so maybe you know maybe it's a good time. We should get up and go now. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam subhanahu Look what he responded. He says, "She won't see me." And she literally walked up to them and said, "Oh Abu Bakr, indeed uh, your uh, companion has." Has, uh, uh, hija is what is when a person composes uh, satirical poetry in order to cut another person down. And so she came to complain that this Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab was, 
was revealed. So she, she was claiming like it's a piece of poetry that was satirical poetry in order to cut her down and uh, to complain to him. And Abu Bakr, what did he say? He said the haq, on the same time, he wasn't so conflict averse that he's going to peter out and uh, be a wuss. You know, he's going to say the haq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says, no, uh, he doesn't, he's not a poet that says poetry. Uh, he doesn't, meaning he doesn't say anything except for it's the truth. And what did she say? This is like, look, you know, a kafir has to uh, go to Tatooine in order to see the Jedi mind trick. <laughs> we see it, Bashar, the awliya of Allah, that they have this effect on people. They have this effect on people. He said to her, it's not poetry, he does, meaning he's, that he doesn't say anything except for the haq. And what did she say? She says, you're a truthful man. And she walks away. And Abu Bakr says, I said, oh, Messenger of Allah, how did she not see you? Did she not see you? And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no. In fact, there was an angel that was uh, shielding me and was covering me with his wings. Meaning what? He didn't get scared. He didn't back down. And oftentimes when it's, it's you know, time to do the haq, or just be a person who does the haq. We're so afraid of people. And the fear is overwhelming, but we forget that there's an Allah there to, uh, to protect us. Don't go out, out of your way in order to, uh, you know, uh, be, be, be hardcore, you know, to be hardcore. Don't go out of your way trying to uh, incite things with people. But uh, also you don't have to sell out and give up who you are. Uh, Allah Ta'ala will protect you. Sometimes the things that we fear are more than, than the things that we need to be afraid of. Wallahu a'lam. Inshallah we'll skip ahead a little bit so that we can... Uh, um, we can inshallah end the, the, the time in time. Inshallah, if you skip to page 131. Just one, one point that I wanted to mention. It doesn't really matter what hadith or which chapter you read from. I was mentioning uh, before this program to Sheikh Musa and Sheikh Hamza that every single one of these ahadith if you ponder over it and you reflect upon it and think about it, put yourself in the shoes of the Messenger وسلم, in the sense of experience. Not, you can, nobody can put themselves in the shoes of the Prophet وسلم, but in the sense that, you know, what if I were to experience something like that? You know, what if people were plot against me? You know, what if the whole neighborhood, you know, with, you know, their, their guns and their bats and their chains, they were standing outside my, would I be able to go up to them, say, Shahatin, would you, you know, Put yourself, so it doesn't really matter if you read the book cover to cover, every single one of these ahadith is a source of inspiration and a source of solace and you know, a, uh, something that we can learn from the Messenger وسلم, to uh, look at his bravery, to look at his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every single hadith here, it has one, common, one commonality. What is the common factor in every single hadith in this chapter is that the Prophet وسلم, he turned to Allah and he took recourse to Allah in every single situation. That is the common factor in every single one of these ahadith. That he took recourse to Allah in every situation. And that is what the condition of all of us should be is learn from the Messenger to take recourse to Allah. Also, if, you, if we pay attention closely to the three ahadith that were read by Sheikh Hamza and the sequence that they came in, it started off with first bearing the hardship of a scorpion, an insect. And then it intensifies. And it became his tribe and his people. And then it intensifies even more and became even those directly who was in his family, his uncle and his wife. Right? So we also face hardship, we face difficulty, and you know, yes, once it starts getting closer to home, it can be a little more hurtful. Right, so you know, it might be something on the news and it you know, doesn't feel so good. But then it's at school, it feels even worse. And even worse than that, what if you're going home and you have to hear it from people in your household? And unfortunately, that's a reality for many of us in our own communities, is that if you try to follow the Prophet you're going to get conflict. You're going to face confrontation and conflict in your household. It might be from those who are most dear to you, and it's going to be even that much more hurtful. But the Prophet ﷺ had to go through it from all levels. From all levels. And Mawlana Hamza, he's going to small jab at, you know, some of you here, right? About how
Tweeted by Sean King, right? Oh man, Blue. Sean King will tear you up. Bring me my blue water, and he made some up. And he went out there, not one of them didn't even look at him. Not one of them didn't even raise their eyes to him, and Sean had to do too. And what's one quick last point also about that, right? Because we, we hear about how the Prophet was a mercy, Rahmat and Adam, and he was, right? Well, understand that in the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had his, right? He had in sometimes a manifestation of the attributes of beauty and grace were there, and sometimes he had the attributes of rigor and wrath also showed in the creation. Well, the Prophet Sallallahu he was a Khalifa of Allah. He was the, represent, the representative of Allah, of Allah on earth. And you're going to see manifestations of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which sometimes are like really, really rough and intense. And that's not contrary to what it means to be a merciful human being and the mercy of all humankind. Sometimes you're going to throw dirt in someone's face and you have to do that. Sometimes you're expected to throw dirt in someone's face. And we have the, the, the wisdom and is, is knowing when to distinguish between when to walk away and when to throw the dirt in someone's face. That's in the company of the people who have that wisdom may Allah gives that company. Mashallah, in interest of having break on time, like I promised, we won't go to the next hadith, even though Sheikh Tamim knows I'm burning inside. Uh, but inshallah, you know, uh, you can't learn the entire deen in one day. That's a trick of the nafs. You'll go hardcore today and then watch TV for the next 40 days. That's not how it's going to work. Keep coming to dars, keep coming to class. Uh, one of the things I just want to note though, however, mashallah, is one of the reasons I love these uh, two mashayikh that, uh, uh, that, that, that we're blessed to have with us is because there's so many people nowadays, they'll say stuff like, Oh yeah, the wudu and the salat is not important. It's important to have good akhlaq. I know so and so, he prays five times a day, but he doesn't have good akhlaq. It's important to have good akhlaq. And like, dude, nobody's saying that it's not important to have good akhlaq. I'm telling you, it's really important to have good character. But what is this wudu and what is this salat? This is deen. And, uh, you know, the, the, the distinguish, wallahu alam, the distinguishing mark in my experience and in my lifetime that I've seen between uh, the Ahlullah and people who are just kind of up there because they, uh, they, they have a, a, a irrational uh, 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 passion for the mic is that the former, when they talk about wudu, it makes you want to make wudu. When they talk about the way the Prophet Sallallahu sat, it makes you want to sit that way. When they talk about the Salat, it makes you want to pray. You're like, hey man, I want to try this out. I want to fall in love with the Salat all over again. I want to do two rakahs right when the break starts. Um, you know, whereas some other people will make themselves famous at the expense of what your 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 ta'lim and your veneration for those things are, um, and for that matter, even good good character and good akhlaq as well. You know, that they make you want to have that good character. They make it look good. They make it look sleek and like 2.0 to forgive somebody. You like, I never thought of it that way. I want to go forgive all my enemies right now. I want to text them all uh, forgiveness or whatever other part of good character. They 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 bring that attraction to you. This is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shining down His nur uh, uh, on you. And the way He does it is through from one heart to the other. That one, you know, like you have a repeater like a, 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 on a wireless router, the internet's coming from the ISP and then the router distributes it inside the building. That, that, that you know, these people are like the routers of, uh, but like not of like something done like Wi Fi, but like the nur and the faith of Allah ta'ala. Allah ta'ala keep their shadows over our heads and keep us in their majalis that we benefit from them again and again and that we live and we die in their company. Sallallahu ta'ala wa rasulihi Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ajma'in. So it's uh, 3.55 and we will recommence at 4.05, inshallah.
Barak Allah Fikr. I took the hit. Yeah. Thank you.